great pleasure uh, for me to be here with you tonight. Uh, and if you find it worthwhile, um, you've got my daughter Eric, who's uh, sitting over there, uh, to thank for getting me here. Um, and just to be clear, that is an unashamed part of a very proud father. <laughs> Defence relations to 
human rights. And as someone who's participated uh, both in my previous role as Secretary of uh, Climate Change and in my role before that as uh, Deputy Secretary of the Treasury uh, in a number of these dialogues in the economic and financial sphere and the climate change sphere, I understand just how productive and worthwhile they can be both in China and for Australia. To further these contacts, I'll be travelling to China myself next month to meet with a range of senior officials, business people and other experts. That's probably my tenth trip to China in the last decade. But broader, broader people, people needs are also crucial and Australia needs to strengthen its China literacy in a literal sense as well as commercially and culturally. We need more people like you studying each other's languages, our histories and our culture and more importantly still, developing friendships. Not just friendships that you make for this week, but friendships that will endure for years and decades ahead. But we need to go beyond just those of you in this room. We need to find ways where we can use less formal engagement between our two peoples, maybe through social media, networks, blogs, whatever, but ways that help us to understand the issues that concern our respective populations. It's only by the people of each country knowing one another that we'll actually really be able to build and develop the relationship that will be so important to both of them. The strength of our trade relationship with China is itself another challenge for Australia. China's rise has been accompanied by a rapidly growing demand for Australia's energy and natural resources. And growth in China's manufacturing sectors has led to an increased global supply of low-cost manufacturers. As a net exporter of resources and a net importer of manufacturers, excuse me, Australia has benefited dramatically from China's development. We can see that when we talk about our terms of trade, which is simply the ratio of the price of our exports over the price of our imports. This is at record levels. And I, I should have brought along a chart to show you. Um, this is not only at the highest level it's ever been, um, it's actually been sustained at this level for longer than has ever been the case. At one level, this is fantastic news for Australia. What it means, though, some parts of our economy is that they face very significant pressures to restructure. Our trade exposed industries outside the resources and minerals, the resources and energy sector, are under great pressure. The high exchange rate, which is itself a reflection of the terms of trade, has undermined the competitiveness of parts of our economy. While the profitability of the resources and energy sectors is actually beating up the price of labour point was made earlier about cleaners in the, um, in the northwest of Western Australia earning um, perhaps a uh, touch exaggerated but somewhat close to what the Prime Minister is. <coughs> I'm resisting the temptation I just spoke about so the task the Prime Minister faces and the task that they <laughs> <laughs> take, take that as read. Um, but as I've said elsewhere, it's as if uh, we woke up one morning to find the world has made us richer. But to benefit from that opportunity the world has provided us, Australia has to accept that labour and capital will need to be deployed differently than has been the case in the past. What this means is that some sectors and some firms in our economy will have to grow more slowly so that the more productive parts can grow more rapidly. We need policy settings which facilitate such change rather than trying to impede them. We need policies that promote investment, innovation, education, and schools. Policies which can increase our ability to innovate and capture new opportunities, and which will deliver productivity gains we need to continue to lift our living standards. Given the volume of our bilateral trade, an issue that I've reflected on in other speeches, and I uh, must say um, in doing so has attracted a great deal of attention, is Australia's exposure to the risk of policy missteps or major economic fluctuations emerging from China. This is important, but as I've tried to emphasise elsewhere, there's nothing new in this. In the past, we've, we've been reliant on uh, markets in the United Kingdom, in the 
the US or in Japan to the same extent, or indeed in the case of the UK, even more so than our reliance on the Chinese market. What's new is that unlike the situation China faces today, those countries were not themselves trying to undertake a massive economic transformation at the same time. And it's that massive structural transformation that opens up the risk of policy mistakes. So it's the ambition of China's development and emergence that raises the probability of policy missteps. But policy missteps in China is not unique. It's not a uniquely Chinese phenomenon. Um, for those in this room, perhaps I'll just point to Jeff and myself, um, who are old enough to remember the experience of the 80s and 90s, when Australia opened up to get its economy, when we broke down a lot of those uh, command and control, those type of features of our economy, we faced uh, dramatic challenges of adjustment. And indeed, um, one could say that there were multiple missteps in policy uh, during that period. What it means for Australia is not that we shouldn't wring our hands about the risk of policy missteps in China. We should work with our Chinese colleagues to help them um, ensure that they minimise that probability. But what we should be doing at home is ensuring that we have an economy that remain, retains the flexibility to adjust to shocks. The sort of flexibility that's been a strong and defining feature of our economic performance in recent decades. A performance that saw us right out the Asian financial crisis of the late 90s, the dot-com bubble of the early 2000s, and the global financial crisis, delivering you, the young Australians in this room, two decades of uninterrupted economic growth and a rise of living standards that probably have not been matched uh, in our history. The fact that you've gone through two, year, two decades of uninterrupted economic growth is not an experience that any of your predecessors will have had. The flexibility of our currency, the independence of the, the Reserve Bank, a clear medium-term fiscal framework, and a strong and well-regulated financial sector all of these are fundamental to Australia's ability to manage the impacts of external volatility. The right domestic policy settings in areas such as tax <coughs> and competition policy, water and energy pricing, labour and infrastructure are equally important. Together, these sorts of policy settings will help ensure that we're in a position to maximise the benefits of Australia from our relationship with China including from the investment flows that likely both expand and diversify across many areas of our economy in the decades ahead. We have a strong relationship, but we must not be complacent about it. We need to be aware of the challenges the relationship presents for Australia and to think actively about how we should address this. And the Prime Minister's white paper is a step in helping us do that. For China, the challenges are, of course, quite different given both China's size and the stage of its economic development. Two particular challenges I see are first, fulfilling the role not just of a responsible stakeholder in the international community, but of a major global power. And secondly, managing an increasingly complex economy to sustain growth, even as China's population ages. <coughs> Excuse me. Greater economic weight brings with it greater strategic weight. China is widely expected to be the world's largest economy within the next decade, measured in purchasing power parity terms, and is increasingly perceived as a rising global superpower. The Pew Global Attitude Survey released in July shows that in 15 of the 22 nations surveyed, the balance of opinion is that China will or already has replace the US as the world's leading supercar. This is a view that has increased substantially over the past two years. Whatever the truth of that perception, with greater prestige and influence comes greater responsibility and an expectation that China will contribute to the provision of global public goods and provide global economic leadership. <coughs> China's emergence has benefited greatly from the existing rules-based multilateral economic financial trade system. The stability and further development of the world economy can only be net positive for China. China's key member of the G20 
and has had its representation on the IMF and World Bank increased to more closely line with its economic weight. However, greater representation in international forum does not guarantee greater effectiveness for those institutions. China will need to work constructively to help address major global challenges, including rebalancing global growth, addressing climate change, finding a way forward for global trade liberalisation, and indeed supporting efforts in Europe to address the sovereign debt crisis. By virtue of its sheer size, no major global public policy issue will be capable of resolution without China. But if China is not seen as engaging constructively on these issues, its interests will ultimately suffer. Now, <clears throat> while China looms large in absolute terms, it's still at a relatively early stage of development. GDP per capita, in purchasing power parity terms, is only one-sixth of US levels. Even by 2016, when the IMF expects China to exceed the US in terms of the size of its economy, its GDP per capita will still be less than one quarter of that of the United States. China faces a daunting and complex domestic reform agenda as it shifts towards a more consumption-oriented economy. As it confronts issues like financial market reform and climate change policy, China's stage of development where whole of economy reforms are more economically desirable and indeed I would say necessary than the isolated pilot style reforms which it's used today. But whole of economy reforms require political will. Just like in Western democracies, China's leaders will need to tackle the stubborn and vested interests. This alone is already a difficult task, yet it will also happen at a time when China's society is aging. China's latest census shows its population is growing more slowly than in the past, but with a sharp rise in those aged 65 and over. UN data projects the share of the working age population from 15 to 64, and the total population will start to fall from 2014. So while China will continue to benefit from freeing up relatively inefficient agricultural labour and moving it to other parts of the economy, there will no longer be an impetus to, dr to growth, driving, sorry, deriving purely from the expanding labour force. Beyond this reorientation of the existing workforce, China will need to increasingly rely on productivity to drive growth. Promoting technology innovation, industry upgrading, and competitiveness will help. Importantly, this requires better resource allocation, and ultimately, I emphasise ultimately, a more market-driven exchange rate. That aside, it's worth noting that many of the challenges that China faces are also being grappled with by policymakers here and elsewhere. We're also anticipating the consequences of an aging society, and we also face the need to improve our innovative capacity and productivity performance. So there's a common dimension to many of the challenges, and it serves everyone to recognise that, to discuss and debate openly uh, what they are, but not only what those challenges are, also what are the opportunities. In a relationship growing as fast as that between China and Australia, there are of course a wealth of opportunities. China is Australia's largest two-way trading partner, with total two-way trade of over 100 million Australian dollars a year. The complementarity of our interests, particularly in resources, has long underpinned that relationship. But trade services has become increasingly important and shows great potential, particularly given the growing middle class in China. China is Australia's largest source of foreign students, making up nearly 30% of all international students in Australia. And tourism from China has grown steadily to, in fact, displace all other markets as the largest source of inbound tourism in Australia last year. But other services, such as financial and professional services and mining services, have considerable potential for increased cooperation. Australia is well positioned to meet other demands of an increasingly affluent society, for example, in food and beverages, dairy, high quality meats, and of course, our fantastic wines, which I hope you've taken the opportunity to sample at length in the week you've been here. <laughs> There's also a great deal of potential in our financial investment relationship. Clearly, clearly I've hit a, a, a 